So our uh, next group of speakers are going to talk about what our uh, Commissioner Snyder called our other native population, our f fish and wildlife. And we have four presenters during this session. The first is Mark Scott. Mark is a graduate of the University of Vermont and is Director of Wildlife for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Mark began his career overseeing the state's wildlife education programs and is also currently a member of the uh, VMC Steering Committee. Mark will be talking about Vermont's big game mammals. Following Mark will be Alyssa Bennett on bat populations and she is a small mammal biologist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department where she works mainly on the conservation and recovery of Vermont bats. She has a BA in ethology from Hampshire College and a master's in behavioral, and I'm going to get this wrong, neuroendocrinology from Smith College. Uh, following Alyssa is Jim Andrews, going to be speaking about amphibian and reptiles. And Jim is a long-term cooperator with VMC, in fact, since his inception. And he is a coordinator of the Vermont Reptile and Amphibian Atlas, an adjunct professor teaching at the Rubenstein School here at UVM, and chair of the Reptile and Amphibian Scientific Advisory Group for the Vermont Endangered Species Committee. And then finally, we have Steve Fascio, who's going to speak on forest birds. And he is a conservation biologist and co-founder of the Vermont Center for Eco Studies, a great organization. Much of his work at VCE is focused on forest ecology, including long-term population monitoring of forest songbirds, ecology of pool breeding amphibians, and vernal pool mapping and conservation. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Right. Thanks, Steve. Pleasure to be here. I, it's a challenge to go at this time in the morning because my mind is wandering given all the earlier presentations and just some, some outstanding information, but I guess it's no different than the way I work um, every day in, in our headquarters office. But I wanted to just give you a really, uh, since I was asked, a quick snapshot, a, a little visit through on three of our larger mammals that are, that are we call big game species in the state of Vermont. They're hunted, they're incredibly important socially and economically to the state of Vermont, as most folks would know in this room, ecologically too, um, out there. And show you some of the data that some of our staff collects over time and actually has been doing it for a long time. And when I go and see my peers in other states around us, they're actually quite envious uh, of the staff and the scientists and biologists, the work we do. So this is some of the, the information I've asked them to, to start off. What's unique here though with our work I wanna point out is the things our speakers talked about earlier, and especially Commissioner Snyder, the health of our forest in the future that is so critical to the survival of these three species and all the other mammals, birds, and plants, and invertebrates that we need to protect in, in, for the future um, to do that. But we work a lot on a daily basis with the public. Uh, with these three species I'm going to talk to you, our framework is what we refer to as a big game management plan. You know, it's like a 75-page document, but we're always working from that and adapting to set certain goals and populations not only for the well-being of these species, but for the interest that people have in the state of Vermont. Three points I just want to make out to you to think about as you look at some of this data is we are constantly over time, probably dating back 50, 60 years ago, refining how we collect our data and developing new population models. A lot of that comes from great work that's done here at UVM, other leading institutions of knowledge that help us develop better statistical models and to, to refine our estimates to do that. But we also have driving us key constituents in the state, i.e. hunters or others, who expect certain levels of these populations throughout the state every year. And we have to be accountable to those people and try to make sure that we manage in these, these critters in that manner. And then the third point that I already talked about is the whole future of these species. And I would argue the forest is an inner relationship back and forth reciprocal between the health of our forest and these species. Um, I'll argue many times that probably deer and moose in particular I'm going to talk about probably are the most destructive animals we have out in our forest environment uh, to do that. We spend a lot of time in public participation. I think our staff would rather be in the picture that you see on your, on your left out there looking at the field and in the woods. The reality is we spend a lot of time with the public, either one-on-one -on -one or in groups. It's people today in Vermont that are the key source that drive our management 
decisions. We don't walk away from knowing the science, but there's an awful lot of social work that we do, and it's critical, because if people don't care about these species, don't help us in managing their numbers, then we're not gonna be in business to protect them and conserve them. Starting off with moose. Uh, where's our moose population right now? I think folks, if you read the media a lot, there's concern about warming weather, how it affects them, particularly the ticks that could affect their health. Looking at, this is the overall population estimates over time. If you even went earlier in the 80s, we felt moose were just becoming established in the state, primarily in the Northeast Kingdom. When you look at the graph, I noticed, I think you look at probably 99, 2000, 2001, we kind of went and developed new population estimates as the herd was increasing throughout the state, actually using hunters. Um, we found that, that the eyes and ears of hunters being out there on a regular basis, and we were able to develop statistical models that help us better get our population estimates on moose. We also do it on deer, and we're actually going to start this year doing it more on bear. Um, we had a, a peak in the state in the mid-2000s, but due to aggressive hunting seasons, we intentionally wanted to lower that number so they were more ecologically imbalanced with the landscape, particularly in the northern part of this state. And the new phenomenon that we're seeing with moose probably that's a challenge for us, it's probably a good thing we lower their numbers, but there's some environment factors beyond the habitat that seems to be affecting moose. Just some of the data that we collect, I mentioned how hunters are a key part in providing us surveys so that we can get estimates. This shows a decreasing uh, trend in our moose population over time. Uh, Unit E happens to be in the Northeast Kingdom. But if you looked at these lines all over the state, they look very similar. Probably in the lower half of the state where moose have never been abundant, you see probably more of a flat line. But decreasing. We collect, since moose are large, bear and deer to, another, to a degree, we can collect a lot of information on them, and we've done that over time. This just shows that the blue line, what we'd say the total incidental mortality, non-honey mortality, the red line being the motor vehicle collision. Again, kind of tracks our population uh, very nicely. But it was an agreed contract with the public to get us where we are with the numbers of moose. Our challenge now is we feel we're a little bit below what we'd like to see for population goals in certain parts of the state. We're right at that goal in some areas, is to try to slightly increase the herd. Um, Biologists, like all scientists in the room, love to collect lots of data. Um, we're unique in Vermont that we've got mandatory check stations for moose that hunters have to bring them in to our biologists to be examined. We collect all kinds of data from age and sex to weights of the animals. And if you monitor this over time, it kind of gives us a good insight to how that population is doing in terms of the carrying capacity and the overall health. Um, the line kind of shows a declining trend in health of moose. This just happens to show uh, older cows, we look at the younger cows, the female segment of the harvest, you kind of see the, the same trend uh, going on there. We look at reproductive rates uh, for the females, significant, and, and you're seeing the same kind of trend, not real drastic, but overall a decline in the health of moose. Um, theoretically, you'd expect that would be reversed when we lowered the population, so it's in better balance with the carrying capacity, but other things, perhaps warming weather, we get those, those real hot days. Moose is an animal of the north. Uh, the boreal forest, we're at the southern part of the range. And as well as ticks, which we're spending a lot of time trying to monitor them right now on the moose. Switching over to deer, um, I'd like to tell you folks where this deer is presently right now. Those of you who like to hunt deer, you've got two more days to try to find one of these, um, but I can't. <laughs> no. uh, look at our deer population. A little different story here. Um, this is just looking at basically the last uh, 15 years where we felt we've had good population estimate models. We're dealing with a, a stable, basically, herd. Um, we're, the lower red line and the higher red line is what we have established throughout the state. We've established this in six regions, our population density goals that we have. And there was a contract that we did with people all over the state of Vermont, hunters, foresters, landowners, et cetera, um, who have an interest in deer. Data that we've been collecting forever, even before the 1980, is, is the, you have to report a deer if you're shot in the state of Vermont. Most of the hunters hunt deer, will like to hunt in the rifle season for bucks. Again, this kind of monitors the trend that you see in our deer herd in the last 25 to 30 years, peaked around probably 1990 through 94, through different aggressive management programs by the state. We were able to lower that herd, and then the, the other influences we've seen over time, I'll show you a picture here, tends to come down on the winter severity, um, which is interesting, trying to predict what the future is going to hold for white-tailed deer in the state of Vermont. Most likely, if we have warming trends of weather, uh, deer are going to do quite well. Our challenge will be able to control their numbers. At the same time, if we had, like we had the two previous winters, these bars, uh, kind of the height of the bars show you how severe the winter is. 
The, the orange bar going through the graph is roughly around 50 points. We, we have 37 of these stations around the state. We've monitored them for years. If snow depths over 18 inches, which is the belly of a deer, or the weather dips below zero degrees centigrade, we just add a point. And it, it, the reality is really interesting, is this data probably is the best predictor we have on winter survival of white-tailed deer um, in the state of Vermont. Other states now uh, adapt this uh, model, and it's fairly simple, but it works um, for us. Right now, we don't have any bars accumulated for this winter uh, so far, so it'll be an interesting challenge to do that. And like I mentioned to Moose, that the key for us is tracking the reproductive and, and recruitment of our animals into the population. Some health information, uh, our biologists log countless hours running biological check stations, mostly the first few weekends of the seasons when hunters are most successful. But this is just looking at uh, weight. It's showing that basically we've got a healthy population right now in the state, only I think because of some aggressive hunting programs uh, where we've been able to keep that deer herd in check. Um, statewide antler by animal deer. Switching to bear, which is a little bit, a uh, little bit different things going on in bear than we see in deer. I mean, when I was a kid in the state growing up in the, uh, I won't tell you exactly, but let's say quite a few years ago, um, in the 60s we had a booming deer herd. It was rare to see a bear. Now I'm amazed where I go to the dentist, I go to the doctor, go wherever, and they're talking to me about bears running through their backyards. And you know, when you saw a bear in Vermont 30 years ago, you go, wow, aha. Uh -huh. um, not so much today. Our population data that we have in our models tries to show that. We basically, if, if you look at the, the last, uh, since 85 to almost present, this data has been accumulated since 2010, increasing bear population. That's no secret to anybody here in this room. Um, the yellow bar gives us our high estimate, the red bar the low. We're constantly trying to evaluate our techniques to get a better handle on the bear population in, in here in the uh, state of Vermont uh, to do that. Um, other data that we're constantly collecting, incidental mortality like we did with a moose. You hit a moose or a bear in the state of Vermont and we find out about it usually. Where deer, not always uh, the case um, to do that. But you can see with the, the brown bar here, um, it fluctuates over time, but it's a pretty good tractor of showing an increasing population of bear. I don't have the data for the last couple of years in front of you, but if you look at that, it seems that with a little more aggressive hunting, we've expanded the season the last couple of years, these shifts are starting to go down. Um, and bear numbers in the state of Vermont. The green line is interesting. That's the amount of damage. You can see where it peaks up in 2012. It kind of tracked our incidental mortality that was quite high that year. Um, those are, are folks who are, have to go out and remove a bear during the non-hunting season uh, where it's getting into corn or beehives or things like that. Some regulatory changes we were actually able to do a couple years ago is to make it a little tougher for someone just to go out and kill a bear in their backyard doing damage. They've got to make some efforts to prevent that damage um, from going on. Um, the ag industry part of that is exempt. I show this slide here is that as with the moose and deer, you can't talk about bear without showing a cub. But this is the future. Um, you know, we, we, we've got to constantly monitor the, the recruitment of these animals, keep track of the age of these coming into the population. And this is an interesting slide, some research that we've got going on right now in the southern part of the state, uh, more in relation to potential wind development that's going to occur is this was a cub pulled out of the den in March, and a year later, this is the same cub. Um, they stay with it with the parents about uh, two years. Our bear, bear, the challenge probably for bear um, in the future, which is really interesting, I'm, I'm kind of catching myself wanting to say this to you, is trying to control their numbers um, to do that. Some states right now feel bear numbers are out of control. So it brings me to one, the, the, Health of the forest is so important, but in particular when we're dealing with these animals and a lot of the other wildlife, is the structure of the forest. This is when we see this information is really striking. When you look at the difference of what we would call young forest, just in recent years, and this is some forest inventory assessment survey data that we look at, you're seeing a decline in our young forest throughout the state. All three of these species that I mentioned to you, at one time or another in their life cycle, depend on these young forests um, for survival. When we talk again about Vermont's forest wildlife, you know, deer can do quite well in suburbia. Uh, it's probably more deer in Chittenden County around, around people's homes than there are up on camels hump in the woods. We're seeing a phenomenon where bears are constantly now showing up in backyards. Although our research is showing those same bears that may be showing up in people's backyards may be the one that's living back in the mountains um, as well to do that. Moose is an animal in the northern forest. We don't want that in people's backyards. The reality is the challenge for us 
is to continue to educate people is this is not what we want to have for the future of bear or deer in the state of Vermont. They're not meant to show up in your backyard and be fed and to be your, 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 loved, your loved friend um, out there. The challenge for us is to maintain these large tracts of forest land, maintain the forest health, the intactness, all those things that Commissioner Snyder pointed out to you in the future. And that'll determine the, the long-term survival of these species. And what's most important is we need to maintain hunters as one of our key management tools. I would argue that if we lose those large forest blocks as Vermont, if we start losing acreage to development or fragmentation or small parcels, it does make a big impact on hunting participation and our ability to manage their efforts to control these numbers so they're in balance with the habitat. Thanks.